If you're standing, remain standing, and let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, speak through me up here, and let today's message not be anything about me. Let it not be about the band. Let it not be about any one of us here. Let it all point to you. And just fill me with your spirit and fill this entire room with your presence as we get ready to hear a deep truth about you. We love you. Amen. Last week, we began a journey into learning a little bit more about who God is and what he is like based upon a journey that I took several years ago and a journey that kind of challenged myself with maybe the unanswerable question of how can you describe God? How can you describe the Trinity, three persons in the Godhead but one God? And last week we kind of tackled a little bit of that unanswerable question and developed and came up with a framework that can describe God as a circle with each of the members of the Godhead pointing forward to the next member of the Godhead. But we discovered last week that it wasn't just a closed loop or a closed circle that nothing can get into. God actually wants to invite us into his circle. And there was a verse that we looked at last week that's found in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 15 and 16. And I glossed over one part of that verse intentionally because it's the catalyst, it's the starting point for where we're going to begin today. So John 14, starting in verse 15, verse 15 and 16. You can turn, tap, swipe there, look at the screen, any way works. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. This was when we were talking about and unpacking who the Holy Spirit is. But what I glossed over, what I skimmed over is this first part. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And as I read this, as I was trying to unpack and learn more about God, this idea of, well, this question, like, Am I really loving God like that? Am I really loving God by obeying? And that's a question that challenges a lot of people. At least it challenges me and it's challenged me for a long time. But as I looked into this, Jesus is saying, you will obey my commandments. And so I thought about it for a moment. I said, okay, what are Jesus's commandments? What's Jesus's commandments? Well. As I'm thinking, didn't Jesus, and Jesus did just a chapter before this, share a new commandment? John chapter 13, in verse 34, he says, I am giving you a new commandment. This is at the Last Supper, like right after Judas left and right before he gets ready to tell Peter that Peter's gonna deny him even though Peter's saying, nah, I'm gonna go with you to the end. Right in between that, he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Everyone will know that you are my disciples because of your love for each other. And that's powerful. Love. We're to be known for our love for one another. And so, as I was thinking about it, all right, that makes sense. Love. Love's kind of at the heart of everything. But I went back to that initial verse. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Commandments. There's, it's a plural. It's not a singular. Jesus just said, I'm giving you a new commandment. So, it, so that's, that new commandment must be part of it, but there's got to be something else. And so I'm thinking, all right, Jesus, What other times did you really talk about commandments? 
commandments in the plural. And didn't take long for the thought to come into my head. Didn't, didn't a religious expert kind of come to Jesus and say, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Like, don't you, like, several different of the, several of the gospels talk about an event like this. Could have happened once, it could have happened multiple occasions. There's a bunch of different ways that the event takes place. So we'll look at Mark. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28. One of the experts in Moses' teaching went to Jesus during the argument with the Sadducees. We talked about Jesus pushing back against the Sadducees a few months ago. One of the experts went to went during this argument and he saw how well Jesus had answered them. He's like, that was a really good response. And so he asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of them all? I know that there's all of these commandments. There's like the 10 and then there's the whole other slew of them. There's 613 do's and do nots. There's a whole collection of the do's and we, God wants you to do this and there's a whole collection of the do nots. God doesn't want you to do those things. So which commandment is the most important? I want to know, if I got to narrow it down to one, what would that one be? And Jesus answered him, the most important is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord our God is the only Lord. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But before you think that that's it, the second, is the mo- the second most important commandment is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And so, he says, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, all right, here's number one. Number one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. But, but we really can't stop there, like just barely inching up there, like it's a barely a second. Love your neighbor as yourself. And on all, all the commandments center around these two things, on love, love. So we have three commandments. We've got loving God, we've got loving God, others, and we've got loving our other believers. We have loving our neighbor, we have loving our other believers bringing Jesus' new commandment in. But as I have been in the church world long enough, and I've been in Christianity all my life, I've often heard people talk about the 10 commandments, and really Jesus kind of summarizing the 10 commandments with those two Summaries, the love God and love others. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so I thought, well, Jesus started by saying, you'll obey my commandments. And so I asked a question, and as I share some of these questions that I ask, you're probably going to think I'm very odd. At least by the end of this entire series, some of the questions that I ask myself might appear to be very odd. They're very revealing and some of them actually aren't great questions. Because I asked, the next question I asked myself is, well, so Jesus is saying, love me, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. What about the 10 commandments? So I said, so like any good Bible student, I decided I'm gonna search Google for an answer to this question. Okay, so I typed into Google, I said, Scriptural evidence for Jesus giving the Ten Commandments. God spoke the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And we don't really know which member of the Godhead was there. So I'm like, okay, somebody's got to have tackled this question before. Scriptural evidence for Jesus giving the Ten Commandments. And what Google responded back with my question very humored me as well as shocked me. Because in the first five pages of results, kind of flipped through five pages, there were about three different categories if I were to summarize what I came up with, and none of them answered the question that I was asking. There was one group that was talking about how Christians are no longer under the law. They were saying, Cross, did away with the law, don't need to worry about it anymore. There was a group of Christians who were saying, like, Jesus 
Essentially, God gave all the commandments. And so, regardless of what the cross did, everything, all 613 are still important. And then there was another group of websites. This was the majority of the websites, actually, that latched on to one specific commandment, either both for or against. And that's the fourth commandment. There was a group of people saying, hey, the Sabbath is where it's at. Group of people saying the Sabbath is not where it's at. And of the few sites of it, I narrowed in on and clicked through to, there was one that had basically all 613 do's and don'ts listed. It was actually kind of neat. So I could kind of read all the different things that the Old Testament books of Moses says that we should and shouldn't do. But then there was another one that caught my eye that both fascinated me and bothered me. And I'm sure it might bother some of you because it was a website, it was going after the Sabbath. And it called the, the first, it was talking about, okay, so in the 10 commandments, there's nine moral laws and then there's the Sabbath. It's nine moral laws, but then there's a Sabbath. And I'm just thinking, okay, why? Why right kind of in the middle would there be a not moral commandment amongst a bunch of moral commandments? It just doesn't make sense in my mind. And so I came up with another question. Another question entered my mind. Is the order of the commandments important? I don't know if you've ever thought about the order of the commandments is like number four, the, the Sabbath commandment. Why wouldn't God put it at maybe number seven? Like granted seven days of creation, it'd be perfect as number seven. Or why did number two not be number nine? Why wouldn't number 10 not be number three? Like what's, what's the deal with the order? Is there a deal with the order? Or did God just say, okay, we think off the top of my head, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And just kind of, throw them all out there. So I realized, okay, with my first question, did Jesus, let's, looking for scriptural evidence that Jesus gave the commandments, that's probably not a good question. Or at least not a good question to ask Google. (laughs) So I thought, let me come back to Jesus talking about his commandments, where we were at in John chapter 14. Just a few verses later, Still the same subject, still the same dialogue. I come across this verse, John 14, 24. A person who doesn't love me doesn't do what I say. It's echoing back to what we had, where we had started. And he, Jesus says, hey, I don't make up what you hear me say. What I say comes from the Father who sent me. And I realized, I asked completely the wrong question. It's not, did God give the Ten Commandments or did Jesus give the Ten Commandments? But where did Jesus get his commandments to give? It's back at the source, back at God, back at at the Father. And so the same source authored the Ten Commandments as the new commandment, as the summary of the loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. And so I got a good answer for that question, but it still made me wonder because I had that other question Is the order of the commandments important? And so I thought, okay, we typically have, when we see, when we talk about the Ten Commandments, we typically have something that looks like this. You guys might be familiar with a a diagram that lists the first four commandments as, here's how we show love to God. And then here's the last six commandments. Here's how we show love for one another. But as I'm thinking about this, as I'm understanding the framework of God in a circular fashion, is described by a circle, I'm asking myself, well, if God would, if God's character, if his nature is circular, I wonder if how he revealed his nature to us, how he reveals his character to us in his laws, I wonder if that could work circularly as well. And so, It started me on a journey, or continuing on the journey, but into the commandments. 
And this isn't gonna be a sermon, a message on all of the commandments and how we need to obey all of the commandments. And it's not gonna be a sermon that focuses in on how we need to obey each one or, or one or two specifically. It's probably gonna be a message that you've never heard anywhere else or from anywhere else. Because I've never encountered this idea from anywhere else. And like I prefaced the first message with, I invite you to listen in as I work through the circular commandments. And if it doesn't make sense when we're finished, it's just one person's opinion as God has kind of led him. But if it does make sense, I'm sure that you will have a completely new picture, a new view of what God shared on Mount Sinai. And so, first off, we've got God. We've got the commandments that talk about God and we've got the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one that talk about God. So if you have your Bible still open, let's turn to Exodus chapter 20 to where the source of God writing these commandments are. Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. This isn't Moses communicating, this is God speaking to the people from the mountain. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Never have any other God. Some translations say never have any other God before me. That's number one. Continuing on, never make your own carved idols or statues that represent any creature in the sky, on the earth, or in the water. Never worship them or serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a God who does not tolerate rivals. I punish children for their parents' sins to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but before you think I'm a mean, vengeful God, I show mercy to thousands of generations of those who love me and obey my commandments. Thousand to three or four. That's kind of the ratio that God has to judgment versus love. Just want to touch in on that brief side note. And then continuing on, number three, never use the name of the Lord your God carelessly. The Lord will make sure that anyone who carelessly uses his name will be punished. And then number four, and this translation is very interesting because number four, this translation does not say the word Sabbath anywhere in it. But listen, because what it says without saying the Sabbath is maybe even stronger than some of the commandments or some of the translations that do say Sabbath. Remember the day of rest by observing it as, holy, as a holy day. You have six days to do all your work. The seventh day is the day of rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord your God. You, your sons, your daughters, your male and female slaves, your cattle and the foreigners living in your city must never do any work on that day. In six days, the Lord made the heaven, the earth, and the sea along with everything in them. He didn't work on the seventh day. That's why the Lord blessed the day he stopped his work and set this day apart as holy. It's almost stronger language than what we're even used to. Without even saying the, the word that gets everybody all in a hubbub, all sorts of wild, crazy views back and forth on is a Sabbath important and everything's tied into the term Sabbath. Translation chose not to use it. But what it says is so powerful. Continuing on number five, honor your father and your mother so that you may live for a long time in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And so with this commandment, we kind of transition into the other group, to the group that's talking about loving your neighbor. So we have kind of the next group of commandments on the other side that's loving your neighbor. And so we have the honoring your father and your mother. And then number six, never murder. Number seven, never commit adultery. Number eight, never steal. Number nine, never lie when you testify about your neighbor. And number 10, never desire to take your neighbor's household away from him. Never desire to take your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, his ox, his donkey, or anything else that belongs to him. In other words, don't covet. So I plotted these commandments, and it's a circle, but there's two commandments that don't fit where they're placed. And it made me wonder about something. 
The first commandment is commandment number five. Because if we have the first commandments kind of going over to God, number five doesn't really fit. Unless there's a deeper meaning behind it. And it's representative of how we honor our parents is maybe connected or similar to how we honor God, his role in our life. And maybe the flip side of it is that as parents, at least maybe at the very younger years, we are to be role models and models of God. And God uses a family dynamic when describing himself. We have the father and we have the son. So I wonder if this fifth commandment that initially appears out of place may be just as much pointing to us, our family relationship, as it is pointing towards God and his relationship with us. Honor your father and your mother. But there's another commandment that doesn't fit where it's at. And that's on the opposite side, commandment number 10. Don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. That doesn't fit with the other five commandments. Because coveting is an internal thing. Coveting is something that you do in your mind. With killing, it's kind of obvious there's a life that's been taken. With committing adultery, that's kind of obvious as well. There's two parties that are involved in that sort of thing. There's stealing, it's taking something. There's lying, that's, you have to lie. That's very public, or at least it ends up being very public. But coveting is an internal thing. So that one didn't really fit. It made me wonder, maybe go back to the question, is, is order important? And then I was thinking, okay, what about number one? Do not have any other gods before me. That command, those two commandments together, side by side, both are very internal. Because I can look out at the room here today. You guys are all here. I can imagine, I can assume maybe, that each one of us here has put God first in your life. That you don't have any other gods before him. Because by all means, you're here. But that doesn't really, there's, there's no way of me being able to definitively tell that. I'm up here up front. The same as can be said for me. There's nothing that you guys can look at, to, at me to say, well, he's got to have placed God as the number one person in his life. Well, I'd hope you'd be able to see that, but there's no way that you really can see that. So I wondered if there's something on the other axis. And so I, as I thought about it, I said, okay, well, these top two commandments kind of fit in, a, in the spiritual realm, in the unseen spiritual world. Coveting internal, can't see it, but it's definitely real. Having where you place, where you put as number one, the thing, the being, the whatever you put as number one, that's also internal. So we have spiritual up there. And if we flip down to the other side, well that, honoring your parents, not killing, that's pretty, that's pretty much physical. That's very clearly defined in what you can see in the world around you. And now that I have a two axis framework where it's going up and down and left and right, I started to notice something fascinating. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't have any other gods. That's spiritual and that's directed at God. And then more so directed at God, maybe a little bit more visible, not invisible, is don't make for yourself any graven image. Don't make for yourself any likeness of God. Like, that's still pretty personal. I could have a like, special vase that means absolutely nothing to anybody else but I could have made that into an idol. It could be something even less conspicuous. 
could be something that only is internally symbolic for me, that somebody else could come over and say, well, that's kind of a, a neat little statue you've got there, not having any idea that that's an idol for you. It's an internal thing. Halfway between the spiritual world and the physical world, living in both areas is taking God's name for granted, taking God's name in vain. You can do that just as easily in your own personal life, taking God for granted as you can publicly. Then we come to commandment number four, the one that doesn't seem to fit. God could have put anything in this place. God could have said, hey, you can publicly declare that you're following and you're for me by sacrificing a lamb once a week. God could have said that. By sacrificing an animal, by, by bringing an offering to me, you can publicly, physical world, but still spiritual significance, you can say to everybody who looks at you, I'm one of God's. But he doesn't do that. He instead says, take a day off. Remember to take a day off. And use that day off to focus on me, focus on the things that I've given you. And that is perfectly placed for pointing towards God in a public, physical way. And then honoring your mother and your father, that's still pointing towards God. But it's a very visible pointing to God. In as physical as like honoring, you can say what you want to say, you can say pretty much anything, but talk is cheap. Honoring is an action. Honoring is something that you live. And that's something that's public. Honor your father and your mother is the most public way that you can show honor. You can show God. You can point to God. Then we flip over to the the neighbor side, the most public, visible way, your neighbor, don't kill him, <laughs> don't murder him. Kind of blunt, but it's, that's pretty much the most physical in the physical world, and you can't have people running around killing people and have a good neighborhood. That's what God is trying to say. Just saying, hashtag. Next off, you've got don't commit adultery. That's still physical, but we've got a hint of spiritual kind of blending into it. We've got don't steal. Halfway between physical and spiritual, because you can steal something. But you can also steal reputation. You can steal something intangible, just like you can steal something tangible. You can steal something that can never be repaid by doing harm to someone. And so halfway between the spiritual and the physical, we've got commandment to not steal. And moving on, don't bear false witness. Bearing false witness is more than just telling lies. This is telling lies about people to other people that are when they're not around. It's basically killing, but on a reputation level. Because any lie that you tell about somebody, whether they're present or not, is killing their reputation. And I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but your impression of someone has been affected by what somebody else has said about them, and they had nothing to do with it. Don't bear false witness. It's like murdering, but on a spiritual, on a hidden, on a subtle level. We have a word for that bearing false witness today that's not churchy, even though it's prevalent in many church or social environments, and that's called gossip. This is a commandment directly related to gossip. Talking about someone, whether it's lies, whether you think it's truth, but whether it tells or if it paints somebody in a negative light, 
if it is damaging to their reputation, it's likely bearing false witness, especially if they can't do anything about it. Then number 10, completely on the internal and the spiritual world, we touched on coveting. And it's directed on the neighbor side because you're coveting something that your neighbor has. But your neighbor might never even know that. A few doors down, I might really like my neighbor's house or I might really, really like my neighbor's car. I might wish that those things were in my driveway rather than their driveway. And they might never even know about it. That's why it's smack dab in the internal spiritual world. We've got the circular commandments and that answers the question. Is there relevance in the order that God gave these commandments? It's an excellent question to counteract my somewhat bad question that Google couldn't answer for me. But as I looked at this, as I looked at the commandments, something else stood out. There's a few commandments, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, that give extra details. And number one, before God even says, do not have any other gods before me, he shares something. He shares, I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He gives both his identity and a reason. You know, the the deity that laid waste to every Egyptian God, that's me. You know, that God that parted the Red Sea just weeks, days before, that was me. And don't have any other gods before me. So he gives them both who he is and he gives them a clear reason, right smack dab at the top. Reason, if we're ever to internalize the commandments, we need to have a reason to internalize them. And while we weren't there when God led the Israelites out of Egypt, we also have a very similar reason. And that's in Jesus. These commandments, just like God attributes them clearly to the Israelites being freed out of bondage and slavery in Egypt, we can take these commandments and internalize them as God revealing his character as Jesus has freed us from sin. Is the reason being the cross. And then commandment number two, commandment number three, commandment number four, give details of what each commandment looks like. Number two goes into detail, hey, don't make anything, anything that you can think of, whether it's of pretty much anything that's created, don't make it as a representation of the creator. Number three, don't take God's name in vain because God doesn't like that. Number four, don't work on the day that God is blessed. And this is what it means to work. And whether you think that you can get out of it because, hey, I'll just have my slave over here do it so I'm not working, God kind of covers that too in that commandment. But then we come to number five. Honor your father and your mother. And then a promise, so that your days may be long in the land that your God has given you. Honor your father and your mother. And that's the promise that's clearly visible. And as I've read through and unpacked Jewish history in the Old Testament, very rarely do I see the fifth commandment tagged as being the reason for the Israelites being exiled. Usually it's one or a combination of the other commandments that the Israelites broke, making me think that this promise not only directly relates to honoring our father and our mother, but it's 
the physical, the clear promise that God gives us for when we obey the circle, when we obey the circular commandments. And as I stood there looking at this chart, this, at that point, kind of a sketch on a piece of paper, not nearly as well illustrated as I have here, it gave me a brand new picture and a brand new appreciation for what God gave the Israelites on Mount Sinai. At the heart of it all, it's love. Jesus says, love one another. Love God, love your neighbor. And a new commandment I give you is love each other. Maybe even the hardest commandment out of all of them. Love the people who you are closest to. The people who you, over time, can end up seeing their faults more clearly. Those are the people God calls you to love. That's the new commandment. Those people that you might not agree with. Maybe those people who you might not think are your neighbors. They might live on the other side of the world, but God calls you to love as he is loved. And then it makes me think of another passage in the Bible. Passage from 1 John. The Apostle John is now writing a letter to fellow believers all throughout the early church. And this is after Jesus has gone up to heaven and the disciples are building and continuing on what Jesus had started. And John says, dear friends, we must love each other because love comes from God. Love is at the center of what comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. God has shown us his love by sending his only son into the world so that th- we could have life through him. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment for our sins. At the heart of this entire discussion is love. And at the heart of this entire discussion is God revealing him, himself, his character, and who he is through his love, through Jesus on the cross. And as Jesus butted up against the Pharisees time and time again, throughout his ministry, it's not because they didn't understand the 10, it's because they had fallen away from the heart at the center. That's the hypocrisy. That's the downside, and that's the trap that the Pharisees had fallen into, the legalism, obeying the circle with, while forgetting the heart. But too often, it's just as bad to remember the heart, but to not remember how the heart has been explained. On the spiritual side, in the God direction, in the physical world, and how it relates to our neighbor. And if we ever wonder, if we ever look back and forget what this means, God gave us a clear answer. And it's looking at Jesus and looking at what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And that's the clearest picture of what God views us, how he sees us, and how much he loves us.